Okay. So, hello, Joel. How are you? I'm doing very well, Cheryl. It's a pleasure meeting you. Yes, it's a pleasure meeting you as well. Um, so, I think we had a little bit of a brief conversation before we started here that you're in Aurora, um, and uh, the weather's not is it sunny but it's starting to snow there yes <laughs> so and a little bit the same for me here in london so um so yeah i'd like to just kind of have a conversation with you about some uh, questions that we have so the first question that i have for you is just tell us a little bit about yourself and the journey that led you to become a leader and a mentor of the catholic faith and education Thank you so much for talking to me this afternoon. Uh, like you said, my name is Joel Chutzi. I'm the superintendent of uh, education, school leadership at the York Catholic uh, District School Board. And um, to really speak about my journey into leadership, it will, it's going to take us a whole day. But uh, just to uh, create perspective, I'll break it down to the shorter version that started about 23 years ago when I decided to leave my homeland of Zimbabwe to come to Canada. And um, I was already a trained teacher by then. And uh, coming to Canada opened a new sort of vision that I'd not imagined. All what I needed, uh, having come from a family that treasured learning and education, was to become a teacher. And as soon as I entered the uh, Canadian classroom, my eyes were opened to a new perspective of learning that I had not imagined is I began to see right from the onset uh, the challenges that many students who looked like me were facing in the schools that I worked into. So I did a lot of initiatives as a teacher to try and uh, bring change and um, bring seven uh, challenges forward to improve the lives of uh, those students. And in that capacity as a teacher, I, I suddenly realized my control and um, sort of uh, ability to make the change was limited. And that sort of opened the journey to go into leadership. I said, you know what, maybe if I become a vice principal, then I'm going to be able to have a bigger voice to do things. And sure enough, when I became a vice principal, it happened. I, was, I began to bring up some initiatives that saw a little bit of change, but still I had to rely on, on the principal to do that. And um I said, hey, let me get my own school as a principal. And sure enough, when I became a principal, when I became a principal, a lot of initiatives were made in those chain in that in that school. And uh, this is Father Michael McGivney Catholic High School in Markham, whereby we began to do a lot of changes that saw a lot of um, improvement for students, for racialized students and many other students who looked like me. Mm -hmm. And as we did well in that school, we felt it was important to also do the same thing in other schools. I think that's what brought my journey to become a superintendent whereby I'm trying to see what we did in these schools and try to replicate that in all the schools in our school board. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a, you moved from more of like an individual to a, a school perspective to now more of like a system perspective in your role. That's very interesting. Have you ever thought about um, if you had done leadership within your home of Zimbabwe and yeah. whether it was, um, if it's kind of like would have had the same, you would have been able to make the same kind of change if you were in Zimbabwe versus um, here in Canada, like would it have been a different process? I think the change would have gone into a different direction because um in as much as the challenges we are dealing with, um, in my home country, we're dealing with colonization, whereby we were coming from a lot of uh, shifting our education system from a colonial uh, perspective of learning into our own uh, uh, sort of uh, local learning, whereby we had to decolonize the curriculum. Yeah, there was also systematic racism again that I didn't feel in the other side of my world. So right. in either way, there was a shift that was needed yeah. there in my homeland from the colonial element here from this discriminatory element whereby there's a lot of us missing in the curriculum. So either way, I would have seen the same tra uh, trajectory taking place. Yeah, a, a, a big shift in one direction or the other. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Did you face any barriers to becoming a Catholic administrator once you were here in Canada? 
I'm actually surprised it happened. As I sit on this chair where I am as a superintendent at times, I'm in shock to say, how did this be become? And I can relate this story to many uh, racialized people who were in my situation as a teacher, whereby at that point, I felt like I was invisible. There are many initiatives, there are many contributions that I brought to the table that were never acknowledged or taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And those small things began to lead to, lead to some, although it was almost some microaggressions that continued to happen that began to even challenge myself psychologically way because I, I, I began to feel a sense of inadequacy or a lot of self-doubt in what I was doing as a teacher. And that developed uh, into some imposter syndrome whereby if I didn't have one or two people who lifted me up, mm -hmm. I don't think I was going to be able to get up because at some stage I felt uh, hopeless and I felt I couldn't do it. I felt like, who am I to do this? This is not the job for me. And um, this is because of those microaggressions that hit you every day in the job. So this is the main problem that has happened in our system whereby as uh, Black people, we are surrounded by so many challenges that come in many different forms in these microaggressions that disarm you from all your confidence mm -hmm. and put you in a position where you feel you cannot do it. That's why I'm not surprised there are not so many uh, Black uh, uh, vice principals, there are no, not so many Black principals, uh, let alone superintendents, because at an early stage, it has been put into you to believe that you cannot do it and even the guts and the courage to pursue it disappears oh. because of those microaggressions that you yeah. face every day. Yeah, for sure. I can imagine what it would feel like, um, but not being in your shoes, especially like I, I think to myself, <laughs> oh, I feel like I'm inadequate every day almost in some of the things that we challenge, but I couldn't, I could not put myself in your shoes to, um, to know what you've gone through. Yeah. Do you believe there are additional barriers to overcome as a black man in Catholic education? I think a lack of representation of black individuals in leadership is a big impact whereby without that representation, the, there's lack of uh, opportunities uh, for professional development of mentorship, advancement or networking, whereby I needed um, a mentor to grow from where I started from. But I can imagine for the many uh, Black people who would like to pursue the same journey to be where I am in many different parts of the province, there's lack of that network and support system that can be put in place to even build the initial um, uh, dialogue to take place. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I've also seen on the way is you, as a Black man, I'm often challenged and undermined and misunderstood in many times in things that I can simply sit in a meeting and hear other people talk about and they are easily acknowledged. I find there's a lot of that challenge of being uh, um, undermined, uh, misunderstood, and at times um, totally dismissed. And that sort of controls and holds you back in terms of uh, moving on and um, it remains a barrier in terms of uh, the leadership development. Okay, yes, thank you. Why is it important to take the time for Black Excellence and Heritage Month to reflect, think back and celebrate Blackness in all its forms? I always see the Black Heritage um, Month and uh, Black Excellency as one step forward to having Black heritage and Black excellence is an everyday uh, curriculum all year round. Mm -hmm. you know, we celebrate, for example, uh, Black Heritage Month, it's, 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 a, it's a month, but it's just a step that we're using to build capacity to make sure that this finds itself in our schools, in our curriculum every day. It serves as a reminder of the importance of diversity and inclusion in general and it promotes a deeper understanding and respect uh, for Black history and culture when we do it. 
It's also, it's also vital for celebrating and recognizing achievements and struggles of members of black community who historically uh, or presently uh, feel invisible. You know, I talked about being invisible before, but during uh, when we talk of black excellence and black heritage, uh, heritage month, we're talking of that opportunity to highlight all those achievements that are not usually talked about and that are unknown. It's easier to dismiss and undermine uh, the black culture and black people because we don't know so much about them. But the moment we start grasp and digging into the culture, the inventions, these achievements and the excellency, then you can realize a lot has been done. And unfortunately, that is the narrative that's uh, missing um, in our schools. And um, also it emphasizes the resilience and strength of our black communities in the face of all the adversity that has been um, uh, first every day. So mm -hmm. I look at Black Excellence and um, uh, Black Heritage Month as a way of looking back to what has been achieved to give us the energy and power to look forward to achieving more and inspiring more uh, leaders and um, um, youngsters to do well in life. And we always try to do this um, from an asset-based lens rather than a deficit-based lens, which is unfortunately mm -hmm. what has happened over over over, over many many decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Similarly, from your experience within the school system, speak to the experiences of minority students and the need for more DEI initiatives. So what I, what I can easily say is that in the current system, minority students often encounter challenges such as racial stereotyping. And I've noticed in many board uh, records, there's uh, lower academic expectations from the minority students, particularly black students and indigenous students. And uh, the, these DEI initiatives that we are uh, offer and that we keep promoting um, create uh, equitable educational environments where every student feels valued and understood. For example, implementing an anti-racism training for teachers, diverse uh, representation in curriculum, and offering a uh, supportive program for minority students offer opportunities uh, to raise academic expectations for students. Mm -hmm. And there's enough research from Ontario that shows that these initiatives lead to better academic performance and social integration for all students in general. So DEI brings awareness. And if you attach it to initiatives that promote teachers that build capacity, that can lead to better achievement in students in general. Mm -hmm. Yes, I come from a very strong, affluent school, or I'm in a, an affluent school and um, um, diverse, but we are, as people are growing in this area, um, London is really fast growing, and we've discovered that we're getting a lot more of different um, cultural and, and backgrounds of, of students coming to us, which is, it's great to see because it just allows us more so that we can celebrate um, um, within our our students that are here and the new students that are coming. So yeah, yeah, definitely. If you could change or add anything to the present school system to foster greater equity and inclusion, what would that be? My biggest go-to would be a diverse uh, leadership and educators. I believe that's where the narrative starts. When you have leadership and educators that understands the learners that are within the education system, then that's a very good starting point. Because this is, I'm speaking from experience of what I've seen in my school, where you see diverse leadership comes to speak to the needs of those people that are being represented. And also bring educators in the school that the students can connect to. This is where a learning begins to take place. So mm -hmm. my first go-to is that element of representation. Without representation, we lose understanding. Without understanding, even the good intentions that we have for the students that we have will not go the right way because we are doing something that we don't know. Right. So I've seen many efforts in our schools whereby we are putting initiatives and we are trying to make the connection with the students and we are spending a lot of dollars in doing so. But because we don't have a deeper understanding and we don't have a way of building that connection, with the students, then we don't reap the results that we want. So my first starting point will be looking at the leadership 
being at a, at a board level right now, I know the importance of being on that central table as we make decisions to say right. oh, we're going the wrong direction. This does not speak to this. Unfortunately, we, we have many tables in our province whereby that representation does not exist. So it's going to be so difficult to speak to those families, to those communities without uh, that representation. That applies to the classroom situation. Without those teachers, then we cannot do much. And also, when we've looked at the leaders, we need to visit to the, the curriculum, whereby we need a diverse and inclusive curriculum that includes the histories and contributions of Black Canadians and other historically um, racialized uh, groups so that they can begin to see themselves in the curriculum and all those things will make a difference. Now, after we've looked at leadership, we'll go to the curriculum then the third thing that we need to do is regular professional development for educators on anti-racism and cultural competence to make sure that they have effective ways to support students. So it's a combination for those things, then sealed by building um, strong student voices in our schools because students can change what our schools should look like. So when we give students a strong voice in our schools, they'll tell us what they are looking for and they will advocate for what they need. And with the combination of those things that I said earlier, I think we can see a great shift in the way we conduct business in our schools. Mm, for sure. And that's one of the things that I enjoy the most is listening to the student voice. When they, can, when they feel like they can come and say, hey, can we try this? Or can we do this? Um, or we'd like to see this happen in our schools. I think that's um, where... Uh, for us, it's kind of like that's I enjoy hearing that because then I know I can if I can do it, I can make that change and help them make that change. Mm -hmm. And it's all come from them themselves. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so from your perspective and experience, what are the types of poverty affecting the lives of students? Well, there is a, quite a lot there when we talk so far, the types of <laughs> but, but I'd like to emphasize um, a few types that I've seen in my uh, experience as a teacher, as a, as a leader in our capacity. The first one that is very obvious that hits our uh, students time again is the socioeconomic poverty. This is where students uh, struggle with basic needs like food and housing. Mm -hmm. When a child does not have the basic needs, we cannot talk even about learning. Right. The learning becomes secondary. So believe it or not, this was my biggest shock coming to a new country, Canada, to think that we could, uh, in a developed country like this, to think that we could have students who still don't have something to eat or who still don't have a, a space to, to live was a big eye opener. But mm -hmm. uh, it has become a reality as I work with my schools that we have many students who still struggle socioeconomically whereby they don't have the basic needs that they need for life. And uh, that is one of the biggest impacts. I thought this would be getting better, but unfortunately, as I get statistics from my different schools, I see that um, that continues to be a challenge in many of our schools. And unfortunately, again, it's the same groups that I hit in that capacity, uh, the black students, the indigenous students, they are the more ones that are mostly affected by the, 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 the socioeconomic aspects um, of poverty. And that continues to build the vicious cycle there whereby they continue to underachieve in school. And um, it's leading to the uh, lack of motivation and disengagement in many capacities. Mm -hmm. In that simple uh, line, there's the educational poverty whereby there's the uh, lack of access of quality educational resources and technology, the educational poverty. I've seen it in many hours, some of our schools whereby in certain areas, uh, students don't have the resources they need to be able to excel in school. This was hit hard uh, through, uh, by COVID, whereby suddenly we had to pivot to remote learning and all this kind of business where Many marginalized students struggled a lot because they didn't have the resources that helped many other people to continue with their learning. And it created a lot of gaps in learning that we are still um, um, 
uh, struggling with up to this day. And again, there's also socioeconomic poverty. This is where there's insufficient emotional and social support. And this is also another big margin. Uh, it is a big margin in the racialized communities whereby with all the other things that we talked about, they are hit to the uh, highest level and then they don't have the support to lift them up. So it becomes again a vicious cycle whereby students continue to struggle and um, they continue to underachieve. And uh, that intersectionality of this problem then creates a situation whereby people don't see all these challenges. They see the students and they begin to give them names and they begin to racialize them into other problems without really pinning the actual issue where these things are coming uh, from. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, again, from a Catholic school, I've also seen the uh, uh, spiritual poverty, whereby we've been a lot building a lot of um, teachings on our sp spirituality and on our um, uh, understanding of what the church uh, teaches us every day. And I, I'm beginning to see a lot of gap in, in terms of our students, understanding our faith and how our faith can support us in, in the many different things that we can do. So we own a journey in our board to still raise faith awareness as we also uh, tackle the other uh, forms of poverty that I spoke about earlier that sort of take away from the students and their learning. Mm -hmm. do, do you think there's like through the years of you being um, a superintendent and an, a, an administrator, do you do you see the increase in, in poverty? The, has there been an increase or has it kind of remained stable um, within the schools that you've been in or that the schools that you oversee? I think there's been an increase mo mostly because of uh we're becoming more aware because of the uh, digital world that we, we've gone into. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more exposure and um, we were beginning to see the modalities of learning that we've introduced. We're beginning to see the, the impact of how that poverty has had on the communities. I think uh, COVID-19 had the biggest uh, sort of uh, eye opener yeah. in terms of this as we're looking at uh, supporting students uh, virtually to understand that there were some students who had no space to even do their classes from home. Right. I remember one experience, six students, they were in a room and we had an expectation for them to learn and we we gave them computers to use, yeah. but they were all six of them in the same room. And yeah. these are the realities that we never had seen before because we had not gone into their houses to see how they live. but. Right. Uh, COVID-19 sort of opened our eyes or opened our window into their homes to see um, how tough things are. So I think the impact is actually increasing over the years, especially as, a, as this, there's this widening uh, economic gap uh, that is happening in our world. And those who are suffering are in a worse position and uh, the shifting things on the labor market and everything else, uh, shifting in the nature of jobs that are there and uh, this exposed our um, racialized communities into a lot of suffering that we're talking about right now. Right, okay, thank you for that. Would you say the types and impact of poverty on students and the education system have changed in the last decade and how? I think, what I could say is that there's a growing understanding of how poverty impacts mental health. And this has led to initiatives addressing emotional and social, uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, well-being. Rather than the impact and the types changing, I think there's more the understanding that has changed that we're beginning to focus more on those uh, specific aspects in our schools. But in terms of it changing, Yes, I would say it has changed in the sense that it has worsened from what it was before. So just like what I said in the previous question, yeah. uh, COVID-19 opened the windows and it exposed us to a lot of things that we didn't know. And now we're beginning to see that a lot is happening in our, within our communities. 
Okay. How does poverty impact learning, health, and mental health? I know you've touched a little bit on that already. Um, I don't know if you had more to add to it. So students in poverty are likely to have lower uh, academic performance, like what I said, because of anger, lack of sleep, and stress. So definitely it goes into achievement. And when they don't achieve, it means it already affects their future in terms of life. Healthy issues related to inadequate nutrition and unstable housing conditions can lead to chronic absenteeism in schools. So when we start looking at our board data, when we look at absenteeism, it's not a surprise that uh, the racialized communities, the indigenous communities sort of fall into that. It falls again into the impact of poverty. And the psych psychological burden of poverty can lead to increased stress, anxiety, and other mental health challenges. So as we look at our data in the school board, there's a high ratio of uh, racialized communities, black communities, uh, uh, indigenous communities, when it comes to mental health, it all builds into the, all the things that we spoke about earlier. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Is there a connection between poverty and minority or racialized and refugee groups? I think uh, these groups often face uh, systematic barriers such as racial discrimination and limited access to employment and healthcare. Thereby, uh, poverty automatically comes with all that. I've been in many meetings with communities whereby you get to hear the voices of many families who are coming in as refugees. Uh, you, you get to see many racialized groups and they talk of their experiences. They talk about their challenges and everything else. And you can see poverty tends to dictate the decisions that they make and the way they uh, sort of raise their families in many different capacities. So there's no way we can separate all those things uh, at, 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 at any time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can social justice and DEI initiatives help to curb poverty, poverty in schools? And if so, how and what is the connection? I think uh, initiatives targeting uh, equitable access to educational resources can help level the playing field for students in poverty. So this is something that we started to look at the board to start, rather than just looking at all the schools the same way, we began to look at schools that are more affected by poverty and putting more targeted initiatives to address uh, the specific needs each community is facing. And when we start doing that, or when we started doing that, we began to see a bit of an improvement in terms of uh, the students' well-being. Mm -hmm. we also speak to this, uh, even when we, when we do uh, board budgeting, for the first time this year, we started looking at, as we do our budgets, let's look at certain communities where there's poverty and see what else we can do for them. Because as we look at, at the school data, you can see the underachievement in those communities. Mm -hmm. So we can't talk of... Um, those low numbers and allocate this uh, school budget the same way we've always done over the years, because without addressing or putting specific in initiatives, then nothing's going to change. By addressing systematic barriers and fostering an inclusive environment, schools can mitigate the adverse effects of poverty in many capacities. For example, schools where students don't have something to eat, if you do uh, school meal programs, if you offer scholarships for students, if you offer mentorship programs for students, you know that begins to build capacity in those schools and that can see the underprivileged students um, building a sense of belonging and performing much better in their schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. For refugees and immigrants are seen as double disadvantaged and disengaged. Would implementing initiatives centered around a sense of belonging help alleviate poverty's impact on their lives? And if so, how? And if not, why not? 
I think um, having entered this country a refugee myself, I can confidently uh, speak to this because I experienced uh, what it means to be a refugee the early years before getting into my career of what, he, what life can be. So I can confidently say programs that foster a sense of belonging and community engagement can significantly improve the lives of refugees and immigrant students. So definitely when we build programs, we build capacity, we bring resilience and we bring a sense of belonging to the communities. If we provide language supports, cultural integration assistance and social support networks, we give a starting point for those families because when you come into a new country, you're totally lost. So language can be a barrier to making the next step, the next move that you need to do. Um, coming from a different culture, moving into a different country can be a stumbling block to anything that you need to do. So when we bring sort of build networks that can build capacity in all those areas, then we give everybody who comes to our country a good starting point. Oh. Yeah. I know even um, things, small things like we call it breakfast programs here. Um, it goes a long way and it's, you know, everybody partakes in it, but I know a few times where I've had students say, is that for everyone? And um, yes, of course, it's for everybody, Every help everybody out. Um, so just little small things like that can make a huge difference on students and impact their learning in the schools. It does because, because we live in this country and we take a lot of things for granted. For yes. a new person who's coming in, it's a totally different world. And um, to expect them to maneuver and build understanding. I remember when I started, it was everything was about the Canadian experience. I was already a teacher, but I could not do anything without the Canadian experience. Right. So when we build programs, that provides the Canadian experience, then we open a door mm -hmm. for things to start happening. But if we just say, yeah, this is a new country, get started, it can be crippling. And um, many people continue to struggle today. I can talk of many people who almost came to this country the same time I came to this country, who did not have the same privileges and same opportunities that I did. These were highly experienced people, highly educated people, but because they got lost without um, the support that they needed, they never realized their potential. And up to this day, they're still struggling. Right. However, if it, as a country, we take an initiative to build a strong capacity. I've been listening to the news this morning where we are talking of many immigrants coming into the country and they come with a lot of skills that our country needs. We're getting a lot of nurses, doctors, uh, skilled workers that are do doing different things. If we don't give them the tools to get started, they'll never make it. But if we give them the right supports, they can become superintendents one day. For sure, yeah, yes, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you so much, Joel, for your. Um, honesty and, and sharing your history and your background and, and what your goals and ideas were when you came to Canada. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's been a pleasure, Cheryl. Thank you for speaking to me right now. Thank you.